in the YouTube world. Um, if you are a visitor today, we want to welcome you and tell you how much we appreciate you. This next announcement you can tune your ears out for because it is our offering. If this is your church home, we appreciate you. We have a yellow box in the back there where you can put your tithes and offerings or you can use the QR code if you're tech savvy and give that way. We will have a special offering that's in the offering plate on the welcome table over there for our guests this morning. So if you want to, if you appreciate their music and you want to show them that financially, please put it in the offering plate back there. Our women's ministry is taking a break for a second. They're going to regroup and figure out what they're gonna what what is going to happen moving forward. Um, so it'll be off until after the first of the new year. But be watching in your bulletins and watching in some other ways. I think we're gonna get some surveys out for the women to find out what dates and times work for the women. So um, be watching for that. And please fill it out. Even if you think I don't know if I could ever come, fill it out. Let us know so we know when the most people might be available. Um, I have a slide about prayer. We have a prayer pledge for our 2024. We have an election coming up, in case you haven't heard. Maybe your phone's not blowing up with notifications of um, politicians, but they need our prayer. <laughs> I don't care who you're talking about, they need prayer. So we have a prayer pledge. I think the sign-up sheet is still back there to sign up for uh, dates and times to be praying. And um, even if you can't sign up, just every time your phone blows up with one of those stinking ads, say a prayer because our country needs it. Our growth tracks are taking a break next week. The adult growth tracks will not happen next week. Pastor Ardo is going to the men's retreat. I'm going to be at a wet, uh, coming home from a wedding, and Kathleen is also out of town at the moment. So our growth tracks are taking a pause for the adults. Kids and teens will still have their regular Sunday morning, Sunday school, um, but if you're wanting to join into the adult classes, you'll have to wait an extra week or two. Um, along with that, we're getting closer to that season where we start picking our next series of growth tracks. And so if you've, if you've been thinking, I want to teach something or I want a class on this, now's the time to let Pastor Ardo know. He gets to make those decisions. And so send him an email and tell or text or talk to him. Maybe not this afternoon right after service, but <laughs> talk to him and let him know that you're interested because we need, we need people to teach. Our kids quiz meet is next month on the 16th. It starts at 10 o'clock in the morning. If you're going to volunteer for that, please see Christy back there in the back. She would love to plug you in and get you where you need to go. You can talk to me. I'll direct you back to her or give her your information because she really knows what's going on and where she needs people right now. Celebrate Recovery this Friday. It will be at 6 o'clock. We'll have a dinner at 5.30 or 5, and we'll have a CR at 6. Um, next week, we're transitioning to that small group only format, so we'll have it at 5.30. So this coming Friday, still show up at 6 or 5 for dinner. That'd be great. And um, stick around for 6. So, But there's some changes coming. We have a special training day. If you think you want to be a greeter, which I promise you do. It's fun. It's easy. <laughs> Come on November 10th. Just stick around after the church service, and we're going to have a short training session for what it takes to be a greeter in our church. Um, there's lots of roles open, and there's lots of flexibility. You don't have to do it that often. And, I mean, spoiler alert, if more people sign up, then that's the less often you have to actually do it. So <laughs> come join. Come find out what how we run our greeter team. It's really great. Also, in um, starting that Sunday, the 10th, the children are going to start preparing a Christmas presentation. And that's all that I'm going to say about that, other than if you want your kids or your grandkids or your whatever to be involved, get them here for Children's Church. That's our service during the church service. And um, they can practice and get ready for that. Ardo and I have been working on the date, and it's going to be a lot of fun. I think the kids are really going to enjoy that. So now I'm going to hand the mic over to Pastor Ardo, and he's going to share some more stuff. Can we give a hand for Pastor Amy, who's in the announcements for all this time? Like, it's always fun. 
So many compliments. Um, so, um, as you can see, I don't have my guitar with me. I was talking to somebody, it's like, oh, what a relief. And I'm like, thanks, man. Anyways, um, but I'm really excited to introduce you, introduce to you uh, Bruce and Betty Moses. So a quick story, but, and, and I hope you guys could kind of introduce yourselves a little bit more. You know, I'll let you guys do that because I don't want to say something wrong. But I will say that it was such a treat that I had a, a random call, which is not random in the Lord's kingdom, um, from, from Betty. And I think it was like two and a half months ago, maybe, at least three, you know, a while back. And it's like, hi, is it, are, are you the pastor of Faith and First? And I'm like, uh, kind of. At the time, I was still interim. Kind of, yes, but can I help you? It's like, oh, well. <laughs> and introduced themselves, and I thought, oh, what fun. And I'm so glad you called me. Now, they're going to share a little bit more. They almost did not come today. Almost. But I will, s I will let them share their story. But with great pleasure that I get to introduce to you, please, warm applause for Betty and Bruce Moses. Thank you so much. We want you to join in on the first song and sing with us. You know, we're just here to praise the Lord with you all, and that's what we do. It's a beautiful day outside that he's given us. So everyone join in and sing with us Amazing Grace. Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Praise God, we're going to hurry right along. And uh, anyway, let me move this down a little bit. Here's a song that I usually start the program with. And uh, I'm normally standing up. And uh, here about three weeks ago, I was in our living room and I fell on a, something and I broke my left leg. And uh, enough about sympathy, it's going to get better, and if it don't, it'll get worse. <laughs> my mom always told me, said, if you get sick, you'll either get better or you'll get worse. <laughs> I take the better part. Lord, oh, let me walk another mile, one more mile. I know I just can't get there all alone. Lord, let me smile, another smile, one more smile. I know I just can't make it on my own. Come down from your golden throne to me, only me. I need to feel the touch of your mighty hand. Remove the chains of darkness. Let me see just where I fit into your master plan. Never thought I needed help, help before. That I could do things by myself. 
now I know I just can't take it anymore. With all my heart so many knees, I'm asking you, please help me. do a song that I guess every service we do every concert as we travel this United States we kind of start with these two because they kind of get us into the worship Moving service the mic, and the I mic. praise the Lord for that but you know if you're here this morning you got a problem you think nobody can help you with that praise the Lord I know somebody that can and his name is Jesus you know he's our best friend what we went through in the last, probably the last six weeks with my husband, if it hadn't been for the Lord, we wouldn't have made it through. But he was there. He let you know it. You could feel his presence when you prayed, praise the Lord. And he's not in a wheelchair at home, but he felt the day he needed to be. And praise the Lord, we're going to use the churches. But you know what? Listen to we sing a song. It says, from the shepherd's point of view. You are standing on a mountain Holding the shepherd's hand The valley you just came through Was hard to understand Then the shepherd draws you closer There's something he wants you to see And he points back to the valley and of course it's mystery as he goes so around you and you look back where you've been one by one he answers questions that he did not answer then he shows you the danger of going your own way and the road you thought was better would have led your soul astray Yes, I could be, folks. <laughs> I'm telling you what, you're a wonderful group of people. How many Nazarene we got here this morning? <laughs> Praise the Lord, <laughs> I'll tell you what. I, can I say this? Have I got a minute here to say this? We're Nazarene, have been for about 40 years, and they haven't kicked us out yet, but uh, <laughs> come very close. <laughs> but this is my wife. It has been for how many years now? 66 years. 66 wow. years. <laughs> Woo! Can you believe that she's put up with me for 66 <laughs> wonderful years? And I'll tell you, we met, in, we're hillbillies, by, by the way, from Missouri. We met in, the, in her church when I was 17 and oh she was Lord. 15. I got to tell you this, Betty. Can I tell Go you? Go ahead. She, don't, she says I talk too much, but what <laughs> the heck. I'm among foreign friends. And folks, if you want any picture from us afterwards, if you want a picture with us after the service, it may be the last one till we get to heaven, so you better take it, okay? <laughs> Praise! Behave? I love these folks. I tell you what, I, I know one thing. When we get to heaven, you better like us here because we're going to be up there with you. <laughs> Praise the Lord! And we've met some of the most wonderful people here at this church. But anyway, I'll finish my little story. It's not a story. I had never had a girlfriend in my life. I was 17. Never had a girlfriend. My mom told me, says Bruce, as ugly as you are. If you don't get to doing something and learn how to play the guitar, I'm afraid it's over for you, boy. <laughs> so she bought me an old silver tone guitar, and I, believe me, I was desperate. I never had a date. <laughs> she had a date or two. She was 15, I was 17. And uh, they were having a concert at her church about 15, 20 miles away. And 
they invited me over. Some people there in that group knew I could play a little bit, so they invited me over to help them play. And uh, I took my old guitar, got on my old 47 Chevrolet log truck. That's what I did. I run a sawmill then, and uh, chewed tobacco. I was awful. I was awful, folks. <laughs> and uh, praise the Lord. Never had a date. I didn't. I didn't clean up too good either. And uh, went over to her church, and I put my guitar up there with that group. Boy, they were sophisticated. They were from St. Louis, had on nice suits. All I felt kind of out of place, but I knew all their songs. They were so surprised that I could help them, and I got up here and I played for them. This is a true story, lady. I know you're not <laughs> doubt, you're doubting every word of it, but it's true. I can read that on your face, see. And uh, I like the sound man back there. He's great. Praise <laughs> the Lord. No, both of you. But anyway, I like your pastor, too. But anyway, I got up there and played my guitar, and there was beautiful girls that church that night. There's about 300 people there. And I said, this is it. This is it. This is going to be my date because I played my guitar. <laughs> you think I'm making this up. I'm not. You can't make up stuff like this. After it's all over, put my guitar away. This little girl come up to me. Never seen me before. I never seen her. And she says, will you drive me home tonight? I did. I said, if you can get up in my log truck, I'll take you home. I scared within an inch of my life. She come up in there like a mountain goat. <laughs> we took off down the road. She lived about three miles. She was on a big ranch down there. They were pretty, pretty well to do. I wasn't, but see, she was. She looked over at me after we was dry. I scared within an inch of my life. She said, I know you're not much, are you? And I know you don't have no money. My mom and dad's not going to like you. I, well, I said, i got three things going for me against me now. It looks like it's over for me. But here's the fourth thing she said. Can I tell it? Yeah. You're not going to believe this, but I'm going to tell it. She says, as well as you play the guitar, you're mine, brother. I'm marrying you. Amen. First date, first proposal, you know what I said? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> 66 years later, and uh, what are you going to do? Okay, I want him to do a song. The pastor is preaching on God's love. And you know, we pray to the Lord for things. And you know what? He don't just give us a little bit. He always gives us more than we ask for. Praise the Lord. This guy always says that God answers his prayers in four different ways. Yes, no, wait, and you got to be kidding but aren't you glad that he does answer it that way? Because you know what? If he would give it to us the way we asked, we'd be in a mess. But he doesn't do that. He answers it just right. And just right on time. Praise the Lord. But listen to Bruce sing a song. The Greater Vision recorded this. I love it. It says, I asked for water, but he gave me the well. I came to Jesus. I was thirsty and dry. Oh, nothing could quench this longing of mine. I sound like Merle Hargard, don't I? <laughs> but a small drink of water is all I would ask. He gave me something that he would like. It's hard to believe that I'm a child of the king, for no one could feel more worthless than I. For years I've been searching for life's hidden source. I did not find him till I found the Lord. How many of you ever heard that song before? I just wrote that 15 minutes you ago. Far up, up, from up, up, from up, 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 my soul came a river of, of life. life. A sea of salvation, salvation that, that never, never runs dry. dry. Oh, the story of mercy is mine now to tell. I sent for water, he gave me the way. You know, this.
this will be our last song, but let me tell you, uh, I want to... I usually, the Lord gives me things to say, usually, but this is not going to be one that he's given me in the middle of the night. You know, we're getting ready to write a new book, Bruce and I, and he named it, and it says, We're Victims of a Miracle. We are every day, every one of us, praise the Lord. Things come along. But this happened to me, and it shows me just how much God loves me. We were, uh, we travel. We do 85% Nazarene churches across this United States. We know somebody in about every state and about a lot of the Nazarene churches, praise the Lord. But anyway, uh, we were leaving Buckeye, Arizona. This is four years ago in May. And I had a tablet. And I wanted it, and we, I wanted to take it with me. And we, we got looking for it. We couldn't find it. I don't know where I put it. Finally, he came in. He said, well, guess what? The van's pulling out in five minutes, whether you're in it or not. But I knew he wouldn't leave me. But, you know, sometimes you got to know that it's time to leave. So this was May. We pulled out of Buckeye, Arizona, heading east on a three-month tour. We get up to Pennsylvania, and I didn't really pray. But you know what? God just wants us to talk to him. Not, you don't have to get down and really pray. Just talk to him. We talked to him going down the road. He said, but seen us. But I just said, Lord, I wish I had that tablet and I could read the book that I was reading on Kindle. That's all I said. That was in June in Pennsylvania. We went on and we were in July. We were in West Virginia. We were up in the mountains in West Virginia. It was at a Baptist church, this one. They have Sunday school at 11 every Sunday, break at noon for lunch, come back at 2 o'clock for the Sunday service. And we had done it, and, and you know how little a dash, a van dash is, it's, or whatever you want to call that thing where you put your coffee cups. It's very small. We were getting ready to go down into Charleston at a Nazarene church for the Sunday night, and there's this black object laying on there. And I said, what in the world is that? He almost spilled punch on it. And he said, I don't know, but somebody's brought you a tablet or an iPad, whatever you want to call the thing. I said, let me see it. It wasn't somebody's. It was mine. God had brought that tablet from Buckeye, Arizona. He knew where we was going to be on that particular day and give it to me in West Virginia. You know, if you've got a problem here today you think nobody can help you with, I know somebody that Amen. can, praise and his God. name is Jesus. He's never too busy, praise the Lord. But I told that story. We were just north. We just finished a concert, and a gentleman came up to me afterwards, and he said, you know what? I bet that thing was deader than a mackerel. <laughs> and I'm thinking, God wouldn't brought me back a tablet that was dead. It was live. It was, uh, you know. And then I had a lady to come up and say to me, you know what? That really didn't happen, did it? Yes, it did happen. Exactly like we said. I don't know whether God, or Jesus, or whoever brought it to me or my guardian angel, but he showed me that there's nothing, no nothing that he can't do. And I love him with all of my heart. And every chance I get to tell somebody about him and introduce you to our best friend, that's why we travel to do about 150 dates a year to see somebody touched, somebody saved, somebody encouraged. I love him with all of my heart. But this song right here we're going to do, I wrote this part of it. I found, found it, and I didn't like some of the words. Had a couple of Nazarene pastors kind of say to me, let's change this and that, and we finally did it. Let me tell you what, I hope you like it. Jesus found me when I was lonely. Oh, yes. He found me when I was blue. He found me when no one could help me. And I did not know what to do. I've been up on a mountain with Jesus. Oh, yes, I've been 
been down in a valley so long, but he has never, ever failed me. So to him, with my burdens I go. So please help me walk with you, Jesus. Don't ever let go of my head, for without you I will never, oh, yes. no, never make heaven my this world, if we had all that money could buy, oh, yes, yes, yes. if we had not the love of my Jesus, we would not be ready to go, so please help me walk with you, Jesus. Don't ever let go of my head, for without you I could never, no, never make heaven my Thank you, brother. All right, uh, kiddos, you are dismissed. But uh, before, okay, uh, kiddos, don't go yet. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Thank you so much, Judy, for sharing that update. Uh, and if you're watching this later, Kathleen um, and John. Oh, yeah, kiddos, you're dismissed. Have fun at Sunday school. I mean Sunday school, kids' church. Um, and <laughs> Kathleen, I know you're, you're watching, and you, you watch us later. We love you guys so much, and we miss you more than anything. Um, but take care of John for us uh, as we for you guys constantly and we'll wait for you guys to come back home but once again thank you so much bruce and betty i just kind of wish we had more time but don't we'll we'll save that for another time um but i think it's wonderful and i think it's so fitting that we end our whole series on 
on fruit of the spirit. And um, Bruce and Betty, you may not know this, but I'm kind of a weird person. So what I do is I go backwards from the fruit of the spirit. I usually start with love, but we start from self-control. And now we're working backwards. And I did this on purpose because I recognize as I'm preparing for the, the series that, wait a minute, love pretty much encompasses the other characteristics, the attributes of fruit of the spirit. So I think it's just fitting that we end it by talking about Love, and it's not just any love, but it's God's love. Because we, could, we have some love, and 60-plus years of marriage, there's some love going on between the two of you, and we could see that. And I think it's wonderful. May we reach that. <laughs> and uh, there is, there, there, there's all sorts of love that could be mustered in life, but there's something about God's love. And we're going to talk about agape. And if you, know, if you know what that word is, and it's okay, it's for the Bible nerds. The, the Greek word for love is agape. And it's not just any love. It's not just I love pizza and I love my mom and I love Jesus. It's, it's a different kind of love in which we will see together. But before we do, let's, let's watch this video because it talks very briefly first before we dive into the word of God about what agape love is. So Dave, can we just watch that video together? So if you've heard of Jesus, you probably know about one of his famous teachings called the Golden Rule. Do to others what you would want them to do to you. And this, actually, is a restatement of something else that Jesus said, that the meaning of life is to love God and love your neighbor as yourself. Now, that's really beautiful, but what does he mean exactly by the word love? It's an unclear word in English, because you can love your mom and you can love pizza. And if the word love means the same thing in both of those cases, your mom's going to feel real bad. So what did Jesus mean in his language? Well, first of all, this love your neighbor phrase is a quotation from the Hebrew scriptures where the word for love is ahava. However, the language Jesus spoke and taught in from day to day, it was a cousin language of Hebrew, that is Aramaic, in which the word for love is rachma. But then, as Jesus' followers spread his teachings around the world, they translated them into Greek using the word agape. But here's what's fascinating. The earliest followers of Jesus who wrote the books of the New Testament in Greek, they didn't learn the meaning of agape by looking it up in ancient dictionaries. Rather, they looked to the teachings of Jesus and the story of his life to redefine their very concept of love. So one time, Jesus was asked about the most important command in the Jewish scriptures. And he first quoted from the ancient prayer in the Torah called the Shema. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart. So love for God is the most important thing. But then Jesus quickly followed up by saying another command from the Torah was also the most important, to love your neighbor as yourself. So which is the most important, loving God or loving your neighbor? Jesus' answer is yes. To ask the question means you don't get his point. For Jesus, they are two sides of the same coin. Your love for God will be expressed by your love for people and vice versa, they're inseparable. And so this makes it clear that for Jesus, agape love is not primarily a feeling for someone else that happens to you, like our phrase, I fell in love. For Jesus, love is action. It's a choice that you make to seek the well-being of people other than yourself. Jesus also went on to teach that genuine love for God and others means seeking people's well-being without expecting anything in return, especially from people who are in difficult situations who can't repay you even if they wanted to. According to Jesus, this kind of generous love reflects the very heartbeat of God. And he took this even further. Jesus said that the ultimate standard of authentic love is how well you treat the person that you can't stand. Or in his words, you shall love your enemy and do good to them, expecting nothing nothing in return. For Jesus, this kind of enemy-embracing love imitates the very character of God himself. Now, we wouldn't be talking about Jesus still today if he had only said things like love your enemy. This is how he actually lived. Jesus was constantly helping and serving the people around him in very practical and tangible ways. And he consistently moved towards poor and hurting people who couldn't benefit him in return. He showed love for the forgotten ones, the people who usually fall through the cracks. And when Jesus eventually marched into Jerusalem, he made himself an enemy of the leaders of his people by accusing them of hypocrisy and corruption. But then instead of attacking his enemies to overthrow them, he allowed them to kill him. Jesus died for the selfishness and corruption of his enemies because he loved them. After Easter morning, Jesus and then his followers claimed that it was the power of God's love for the world that was revealed in Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. As the Apostle Paul put it, 
God demonstrated his own agape for us in this. While we were still sinners, the Messiah died for us. Or in the words of the Apostle John, God's own agape was revealed when he sent his one and only son into the world so that through him we could have life. And for John, then, this leads naturally to the conclusion, beloved ones, if that's how God has loved us, then we ought to show love for one another. So Christian faith involves trusting that at the center of the universe is a being overflowing with love for his world, which means that the purpose of human existence is to receive this love that has come to us in Jesus and then to give it back out to others, creating an ecosystem of others-focused, self-giving love. And that's the New Testament meaning of agape love. Colossians 3, 12 to 17. Therefore, as God's chosen ones, holy and dearly loved, put on compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience, bearing with one another and forgiving one another. If anyone has a grievance, grievance against another, just as the Lord has forgiven you, so you are also to forgive. Above all, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity, the perfect bond of unity. And let the peace of Christ, to which you were also called in one body, rule your hearts and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell richly among you in all wisdom, teaching, and admonishing one another through psalms, hymns, spiritual songs. Thank you, Betty and Bruce, for leading that today. Singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do in word or in deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Heavenly Father, we give thanks for your word today. We give thanks for our time to worship today. We give thanks for Betty and Bruce to join us this morning to lead us in worship and in reflection through singing and song. We thank you for our time today. We thank you the update on Kathleen, uh, uh, from Kathleen about John. We thank you that you're healing Bob Brooke right now in the ICU. We thank you, Lord, that you are touching the husbands and wives and loved ones and our family in this community. Lord, more and more we see your work and your spirit in our lives. We know that you are at work. We know that you are for us and not against us. But God, help us because without you, we cannot understand what the scripture means. So Holy Spirit, illuminator of the scriptures, speak to us. May we listen and may we obey. And let us walk in your truth and become doers of your word and not just hearers of your word. We love you, God. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. Love at the center of the Christian faith. You know, we, we, we sometimes work things backwards. Uh, um, and, and I think it's fun to have for the last nine weeks, the last, yeah, it's been nine weeks, guys. So congratulations, you, we made it. And if it's your first time, then you could backlog on YouTube. So praise the Lord for the internet. Sometimes it's useful. Sometimes. Um, and we work backwards, right? And why don't we? Because doesn't love lead us to self-control? How else would you have self-control? How could we be gentle without love? Like, tell me a version of gentleness without love. How can we have faithfulness that manifests itself without love? Where is goodness if not for love? Can, we, can love not produce kindness in our lives? I think that's the natural production of love. Love is patient, according to 1 Corinthians. We hear it at weddings all the time. Love is patient. It's right there, okay? What's the Greek in, of love is patient? Love is patient. Okay? Love results in true peace in the Lord. If not, if not for love, uh, God's love, how can we have true peace or shalom from the Lord? And doesn't love bring us to holy joy? We talked about this last week, of what it means to have joy. So I think it's, it's I don't know how else to end this, and, but just to dive right in and ask the question, how do we best frame God's love in our world today? And it's one of those topics that you, you have 20 preachers preach about this, you'll have 20 different sermons, even with the same passages. Okay, I guarantee you. So you have my version today, 
my hopes is that it's that's exactly what the Holy Spirit wants to speak to you today. But I, I see it as how to frame it, because there's no way to explain love as it is just to see love right here, <laughs> okay? But I want, I, want, I want us to frame it. So how do we best frame it? And if you Google right now, the world population, there's 8.16 billion people as of 2024, today. And so the first thing that I have to tell you, tell me, all of us, that the cross of Jesus Christ, that cross 2,000 years ago, is the ultimate expression of God's love. For 8.16 billion people in the world today, if this is a youth, if this is the YouTube video that you're watching in 20, in 2034, 10 years from now, I don't know who's watching in 2034. I don't know if it's the same number, but by then, guess what? The cross is still the ultimate expression. And his blood is enough for whatever number of billion people we'll have in 2034. But as of today, 8.16 billion people, and that is how all of us, 8.16 billion people, can see and experience the love of God. It is in the cross of Jesus Christ. We have to begin with this. Romans, 8 verse, Romans 5 verse 8, For while we were still helpless, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. That's you and me. For rarely will someone die for a just person. I mean, that could happen. Though for a good person, perhaps someone might even dare to die, right? I know for sure, Betty, in a a, a second, anything for Bruce and vice versa. Bruce will, 0.088 seconds, he'll do it, okay? But God proved his own love for us that while we were still sinners, while we were away from God, (laughs) while We didn't care about God. We didn't care about him. We didn't care about anything. Christ died for us. Before he even uttered his word, his his name, before he even knew of what he's done on the cross, he already did it. And so for all of us alive today, this is the picture of God's love. For all of us, April 1, 6, we need to begin with the fact that the cross of Jesus Christ, you cannot get a more ultimate expression of God's love. We have to begin with this. Whether or not you're Christian today, you have to know God proved his love on that cross. And there's no bit. How do I know if God loves me? Look at that cross. And if you have to watch the Passion of the Christ each year to remind yourself of all of the gruesomeness of the Roman cross, you need to be reminded. There's no worse way to die than on a Roman cross. You are literally experiencing asphyxiation and you're dying with every breath you take. And I don't want to go there. We'll save that for Good Friday. But the point is, there is no greater love and expression of love than the cross of Jesus Christ. 8.16 billion people, we have to see one thing, and that is his cross. Here's number two. Here's what, his, uh, I, what I feel is how to frame God's love today that is most, most relevant for us today. Here's what, as I'm reflecting, here's what I find. If we don't have love in our walk and talk as followers of Jesus, so I'm talking to the followers in the world, I'm talking to followers on YouTube, I'm talking to the followers here today, what do we have? I mean, really, what, what do we have if we don't have love? First Corinthians even talks about this. If I speak or human or angelic tongues but do not have love, I'm a noisy gong or clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and understand all the mysteries and all the knowledge, we talked about this at Sunday school today. Like there's, there's a lot of mysteries in God's scripture that we cannot solve in 60 minutes. Okay? And you probably won't solve until Jesus comes back. And even if you know all those mysteries that we can solve on Sunday school, guess what? If you don't have love, you are nothing. And if I have faith that I can move mountains but do not have love, I am Nothing. And if I give away all my possession, if I give over my body in order to boast but do not have love, I have gained nothing. I have correct doctrine, you say, you know, or I say. Okay, great. <laughs> I've read the Bible 20 times and read it in both the Hebrew and the Greek. Okay, nice. I tithe 90% instead of 10%. Awesome. You know, really. I- I've only known one person. I think... I think Rick Warren does talk about that. He says, I literally tithe 90 because I don't need all that money. 
you can fact check that. That's what he said. I preached the gospel and brought millions to Jesus. As if they believed because of my awesome preaching, right? I've given to missions and broke the alabaster offering record. That's super. Good job. I've debated with atheists, agnostics, mystics, and pagans, and they have no answer to my thesis and rebuttals. My friends love hanging out with me. Says no one ever. I've healed people whenever I pray. I mean, I mean, I have the Midas touch of God's spirit, right? As if the healing power comes from you. And so we say a lot of things that makes us Christian. And yet, what do we have according to 1 Corinthians 13? If you don't, if you have all of that pedigree as a follower of Jesus, and yet no one can say the jerk reaction to hang out with Ardo is that he's loving. Like, if they don't say that about me, I could do a lot of things as a pastor, and I have nothing. I mean, and that's sobering. But shouldn't we be instead be saying, this is what we should be saying. I've come to terms with my sinful nature, and I've embraced the love of my Father in heaven. I've boasted nothing but the love of Jesus that transformed my life into a new creation. No matter how far you've gone, you're telling people, you're not too far because he's patient with me, so he's patient with you. And if we don't have love, what do we have? We really, I don't know, I don't know what you have, but you may be missing the point, which is brought to my, my final my final thing before we get a little bit practical. Here's what I find. If we want to love God, and you saw it in the video, but make no effort to love others. So we, we want to love God, hallelujah. But we have no effort to like, no, no need, or later, no, no, not, no. We're missing the point of wholeheartedly loving God. And the video explained it very well. I'll, I'll quote Matthew 22. Teacher, which command in the law is the greatest? And that's exactly what happened in the story. So Jesus finally answered to that, to that person, love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind. Now, depending on the... On the translation, it's either mind or strength. We'll get to that. And this is the greatest and most important command. And then Jesus pulls a Jesus, and he adds, because he's the word of God. He's the logos. He could do that. The second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself, which is another Levitical law, as you saw in the video. All the law and the prophets depend on these two commands. All 613 commands. You want to do them? Just do two. You worry about number 599? Just do two. Okay. But if we make no effort to love others, we might be missing the point. Now, 1 John 3.16, we all know John 3.16. Even my atheist friends could say John 3.16. But few of us remember that 1 John 3.16 says, this is how we have come to know love. This is, what is, this is true love. And other translation says, this is true love. This is how I know what agape is. He laid down his life for us. We should also lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. Wow. 1 John 4.20, John continues. If anyone says, I love God, and yet hates his brother or sister, I'm going to let you read that one yourself. For the person who does not love his brother or sister who has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. It's almost like John is saying, look, listen, Christian, I, I, it, it's great that you love God, but I'm not sold because you hate that guy so bad. I, I don't know. And so John is not sold. Second Timothy, but, but know this, hard times will come in the last days. And I feel like it's almost like we're reading Pace and Roundup, but it's, first, it's Second Timothy, right? For people who will be lovers of, okay, Lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, proud, demeaning, disobedient to parents. Can you believe disobedient to parents is the same line as lovers of money? Ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable. Oh, my goodness. Slanderers, without self-control. They're brutal, without love for what is good. They're traitors, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, holding to holding to the form of godliness, but denying its power. Wow, there's even a, a, 
footnote, avoid these people. But if we can't put any effort, in other words, if we can't gauge our love for God, if we don't say, okay, Lord, how am I doing with my spouse? How am I doing with my neighbor? How am I doing with those that I disagree? How am I doing? So we talked about this a lot in men's coffee and in men's breakfast. You know, when we reflect on, on, on our hearts, and when you, join, when you join prayer night as well, you know, we spend time to, to ask God to reflect on our hearts, and we ask God, see my heart, check my heart, right? Test my heart and see. So we, we're always checking, Lord, how am I doing with others around me? And I love how, I don't know if you know this, but Pastor Rich, our former lead pastor, and I'll give him credit because I'd never heard him, I never heard it anyone say, but it turns out if you do a little Google search, Pastor Rich quoted the great Billy Graham. And what did he say? Oh, am I, am I a little too ahead of myself? Um, I'm a little too ahead of myself. But he says, but, but there's another anonymous, anonymous quote. We'll get to what Billy Graham said. That was a way for you guys to hold your breath a little bit. We can choose to become a disciple of Jesus. And I heard this, and I thought I was mind blown. We can choose to become a disciple of Jesus. I could choose, you could choose. We all could do that, right? But we can't choose the terms of being a disciple. Just let that sink in a little bit. A lot of times we, we think that when we follow God, I could also determine the terms and agreement of following Jesus. I'll do it this way. I'll keep this. I'll throw that. I'll do this occasionally. I'll throw God a bone. I'll do, and it's like, no. You can choose to follow Jesus. You could unfollow Jesus like you unfollow people on Facebook or on Instagram. But once you follow him, you can't tell him, Lord, I want to follow you like this. The way I want to follow you is like this. This is how I, I'm more comfortable this way. And we do that all the time. And when it comes to other people, that's when it's the toughest. And, and I love how the video says, so God, which one is it? Loving God or loving people? And Jesus' answer is yes. <laughs> His answer is yes. The answer to your question is yes. Because in order to love me, you need to love others. And how do I know you love others? Because you love me. And that circular logic actually makes sense if you dive right in to his love that is about the other person. That's what agape is. It's not about you. It's about them. And so to capture the heart of God means to capture how he sees us. Otherwise, this would have never happened. Because if he's only thinking about himself, he would not have spent the whole night, the night before of his crucifixion, sweating blood and tears. Because he had to say to the Father, Father, take this cup away from me, please. These people, 8.16 billion, I don't think they're looking at me. There's no guarantee they'll look at me. And we talked about that at Bible study about <laughs> uh, at Pastor Lynn when, when Tillman was, was leading, about is it God's side, the God in Jesus, you know, the God in Jesus, or Jesus' human side? And we, we had this we had this discussion about which part of Jesus is saying this and which part is God. And this is the human side of Jesus that he says, you know what? Like, I don't think it's worth it. And I'm having second thoughts here. And he's so bare and, and, and vulnerable at that moment. He came to his father and, and, and Jesus concluded, let your will be done, not my will be done. And in other places in the scriptures it says that when he saw the good by obeying the cross, the good of bringing all 8.16 billion back to him, he thought, this is worth it. It's worth the whipping. It's worth the, it's worth the torment. It's worth all of what he's experiencing at the, at the cross. He thought it was worth the effort to love others because he loved his father. And because he loved his father, he loved us. So I want to point out that I don't want us to miss the point of loving God if we don't put effort to love other people. And I think, and I think this quote is so right on. So 
So we're, we're about to close, and I love that we have time to not only respond to God's word today, but I would love to, to, to hear Betty and Bruce one more time, and I think they have, they have a song ready for you. Um, if you. If you haven't gotten it already, for nine weeks, we talked about the fruit of the Spirit. And we talked about, even before the beginning of the series, we talked about, listen, all, all of these flavors, all of these fruits, it cannot bear on our, it cannot happen without, without the Holy Spirit. We cannot do it on our own. Ardo cannot produce more love. I could produce my love. I, I, could, I could produce my patience. I could produce my goodness. I could produce my faithfulness. But if I want God's faithfulness, if I want God's patience, if I want God's kindness and goodness, faithfulness and self-control, I can't do it without him. It requires cultivation. It may take time, but, it, it, but the decision needs to happen today. So this is for the last time as we move away from fruit of the Spirit. The question is, how can we cultivate? And I love this picture of farming. It's, it's a farming terminology. We cultivate God's fruit, right? How do we cultivate the love of Jesus in our everyday lives? Again, 20 preachers, 20 different sermons. You have me today. Here's what I feel is how we can cultivate. Number one. And I think it deals a lot with us. Measure your worth not by how you feel or think about yourself, but what God has done on the cross. Sit on that a little bit longer. How do we even begin with love if we don't even measure ourselves the way God sees us? He sees us so highly that this is worth it. You may not feel that way about yourself. (laughs) You may not feel, and we talked about this today right on Sunday school. You may feel, why would God die for me? Well, he did. It's been paid. There's the receipt. And there's no exchange or refund. You cannot cancel the blood of Jesus. It's been paid. And if you measure yourself from that vantage point, we are getting close to what God's love is. Because you cannot love the way God loves until you are loved the way God loves you. That's why for me, this is this is my own reflection. I for me to have God's love, I need to measure myself not by what I do or don't do, am or not am, am or not. Okay? But it's what he's done. And I think, and I think you know the song, not not because of who I am, but because of what you've done. Not because of what I've done, but because of who you are. And it's like a flip side, right? Whatever you've done, whatever you've done doesn't matter. This is who he is. No matter what, who you are, this is what he's done. You can't beat Jesus. Good luck. He loves you too much. You can't out Jesus, Jesus. He's got you. He's got you gripped in his love that there's no choice but to lay yourself down at the foot of the cross and say hallelujah. That's the beauty of the cross. 8.16 billion people, that's what God sees when, he went on the, when Jesus went on the cross. That's what he saw. And if we can ca- capture that, forget 8.16 billion, what about you? Sometimes the numbers could overwhelm us to think that we're not one of the 8 billion. 8.16 billion. You are part of that 8.16 billion. And he loves you just the same. And I love this, I love this idea that if you're the only one on earth, he would have still died for you. And it's uncanny. It doesn't make sense. And I love it. If it makes sense, it's not his love. It's scandalous. It's not fair. We deserve to die. But Jesus says, no. So if you measure your worth, again, not by what you think, what you feel, what happened, okay? Like, and there's a lot of reasons why that you may feel you're not worthy. And, but it's what he's done. First Timothy says, this thing is trustworthy. And I, and I mentioned this in Sunday school. Christ Jesus came to the world to save sinners, and I am the worst. And I mentioned this in Sunday school. This is Paul talking. Like, and, and, and I was trying to defend him in class. Like, Paul wrote half the New Testament, okay? 
Are you really that bad? Like by world standards, are you really that bad? Are you really that far from Jesus, your Messiah, your Savior, that like you call yourself the worst of sinners? And then we also remember that he was once a top-of-the-line PhD Pharisee who was holding the coats of people throwing stones at Stephen, the first martyr that we read in Acts. And he was the one that was dragging Christians out of towns to be arrested. So yes and no. But see his heart that he knows that he is the worst sinner. So whatever your, how you look at yourself, if you look down on yourself, Jesus disagrees with you, and he died for you still. If you think you're too good for him, he knows your deepest and darkest secrets, by the way. And guess what? He still died for you. We can't escape his love, can we? <laughs> Whatever reason you can muster, Jesus already has an answer, and it's right there. You can come up with anything, and good luck. I'll let you do that. You have the, you have, we live in America. We have the freedom to do that. Make your excuses and bring it to the cross and see if it still stands. It, it's not looking good for you, and I love it. Because we measure our worth not by who we are, what we do, what I don't do, who I am not. But we look at the cross and then I'm like, oh, okay, okay, Lord. That's, that's, that's new. That's how you, mm, you sure you know me? And you recognize he made you. You can't be here without him. Every breath. Every breath in your lungs is given to you by him. So it's like, it's a weird, futile thing to say, isn't it? But it's beautiful. Measure your worth, not by what you do or who you are or who you're not. And now finally, the picture of the late Billy Graham. And Pastor Rich quoted him, and I love it. I'll never forget it. But in my heart, it's Pastor Rich speaking, not Billy Graham. The ground is level at the foot of the cross. There's no hill. There's no valley. There's no one too high. There's no one too low. There's no one aristocrat. There's no politician. There's no lowly man. There's no someone who's too high, too low, too important. No one remembers. It doesn't matter. 8.16 billion were all at the foot of the cross. What's your worth today? Do you know your worth today? You can't, you can't cultivate love unless you know what his love is about. It's not your love. It's not Ardo's love. You don't want Ardo's love. You want his love. And if we embrace being loved by him, we are one step to cultivate love. Because we understand what love is. It's his unfair, scandalous love. That's not fair because it's supposed to be Ardo here. Ardo was the one that needs to bleed and die. But Jesus says, no. No. Take me. And when you see that, it does something to your brain. You, you just squint. Wait, what? We can't cultivate love until we understand the love that he's given us. Here's number two. Now, this is a little fun. Are you ready? Decide from today onward, okay? And I know we're closing on fruit of the spirit, so I'm hoping <laughs> 10 years from now, 20 years from now, right? Decide from today onward that your entire heart, your entire being, and get this, whatever is left, is there really anything left after that? Okay? And whatever is left now belongs to God. Decide today. My heart, my being, and that's that, that scrape over there. Over here. Yeah, yeah. God, take that. Oh, and then whatever. Okay, okay. Here. This one, too. You're already given your heart. You're already given your whole body, your whole existence. And then any crumbs, give it to him. Decide that today. Here's why it's biblical. Proverbs 2, uh, 4.23. Guard your heart above all else, for it is the source of life. That thing, you need to give it to the Lord. Because... You need to guard it. If you have to guard it so well, that means you have, it is precious. 
it is a source of life. Everything comes, your emotions, your feelings, your will is in your heart. Everything is in your heart. Give that to him. Okay. Not because it makes sense, not because it's easy, not because it's, you know, but like you decide today. Again, the, the to-do today is decide, okay? Now watch this, Psalm 42. And we know this song, right? As the deer longs for flowing streams, so I long for you, God. I'm making it up. But, it, but you know the tune. As the deer panteth for the water, so my soul. Now notice how, why does, it, why does it say I long for you, but then some translation says so my soul. I thirst for God, the living God. I, I showed this picture because, because the word soul is what we get the word in Deuteronomy of the Shema, love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your mind, and with all of your strength. Now, in some translations, in all of your soul, is re really the word that we're looking for here is the word nephesh. Okay? Here's a little, 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 little study here, little word study. That nep, that when you, the original language is nephesh. Now, nephesh in Hebrew, literally means throat. <clears throat> I know that if you've been sick lately, you have a lot of sore throat. <clears> throat> literally means throat. Now, nephesh is an interesting word because not only it means throat, but in the ancient world, throat means your being. If you think about it, it makes sense. Because in order to live, everything has to go through your throat. The food, your throat. Your water, your throat. Your medicine, your throat. If not for your throat, you would not exist. And so it makes sense. And I love how in Psalm 42, it's a play of words. As a deer pants for the streams of water, so my nephesh, so my throat. Can you imagine if we change the song? As the deer pants for the water, so my throat longs after you. That's the literal, that's the literal song. So my throat. But isn't that beautiful? that your throat gets thirsty. I love the Bible. I love the wordplay. And as a, as, a, as, a, as a Jewish boy or girl, you see the wordplay that God did in Psalm 42, and you smirk because you know that your soul or your nephesh or your existence is your throat. And then a play of words that as a, de as a deer is drinking and because it is their throat that is thirsty, I thirst for the living God. I need him, and it's my existence. So this is what I mean by your entire being, because your being is your soul, is your nephesh, it's your existence. So you give the Lord your will, your heart, your heart, and your existence, Ardo's feet all the way to Ardo's hair, all belong to him, because he counted all of them, by the way, fun fact. Who does that? Right? Who does that except the Lord? He counts the number of hair on your head. He has nothing else to do, doesn't he? But it's not that. He loves you so much, he keeps record of everything. Except your sin. Hallelujah. Now watch this. What do I mean by whatever is left? Remember in, in the Shema? The Lord our God, is, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, nephesh, your existence, your throat, and with all of your strength. Now, what is strength? Okay, let's get a little nerdy, a little nerdy here. In the Hebrew, strength means ma'od. Now, I love the word ma'od because in Indonesian, there is an equivalent that is very, or the word is sangat. And, and what's fun, if you learn Indonesian, if you want to say something is very, very, you repeat it twice. So, I'm not just baik saja. Baik means good. How are you? Apa kabar? You say baik. But if you want to say you're really good, oh, bike, bike, saja. Like, how happy? I am happy, happy. How grateful? I'm grateful, grateful. You don't add, the, you don't add very grateful. In, in that language, you say grateful, grateful. Happy, happy. That's why if you read in Genesis, what does he say when he created, when he created human beings? It was ma'od, ma'od, good. It was not just good. It was ma'od, ma'od. It was very, very good. When he made you, it was very, very ma'od, 
good. It's muchness. It's, it exemplifies. It, 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 it's a multiplier. It's an exponentialer. Is that a word? Kathleen would tell me. Right? It, it, it's an, it, it, it ex- exponentially goes bigger because that's what ma'od does. And so listen to the word. It says, love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your ma'od, with all of your very. It doesn't make sense. But until you recognize that ma'od means muchness, which means everything else. Abundantly. So your heart, your existence, and everything you could muster. Give it to the Lord. And then in the Greek, it was translated to dunamis, where we get the word dynamite. Which means there's power, there's strength, there's potential, there's oomph. Is that a word? There's oomph. There is now. Thank you, sir. Right? Dunamis, that's how we get dynamite. With all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your dynamite. Your strength. And in the Aramaic, rahma, the word rahma is used to say wealth. So here's the pop quiz. What does God mean by your, your whole strength? Is it very, very much? Is it your power? Or is it wealth? And I hope you kind of know the answer. You know how in, do you remember in grade school, there's that beautiful fourth answer, all of the above. It's a trick question, but it's not. We all know what the answer is. It's all of the above. All of the above. Listen, decide today. Do you want God's love to be cultivated? You don't even belong to you anymore. Christians, we don't belong to ourselves. Do you want God's agape to cultivate in your life? You have to say, my heart is yours. My existence, yours. Everything else around me, yours. My ma'od, ma'od, my muchness, everything else. My wealth, my power, my anything. So you need to decide today. And if we decide that today, we are one step closer to cultivate love. Because it is the Holy Spirit that cultivates it. We are just preparing for him to send rain. But if you want that love to grow, you need to say, Ardo doesn't belong to Ardo anymore as much as I want to belong to me. But I decide that I belong to the Lord Everything, my heart, my existence, my being, whatever is left, belongs to the Lord. Decide that today. And then the last thing, I'm going to ask Betty and Bruce to to begin to set up, because as soon as I'm done, I'm going to ask them to lead us to a song. So take your time, guys. But we're in our last point. And I believe this is how we cultivate love, God's love, God's agape love. We need to ask for and resolve to, okay? Ask for and resolve to love in the power of the Holy Spirit. There needs to be an intentional decision that of all the fruits of the Spirit, of all the characteristics of the Spirit, of all the attributes of the Spirit, of all the results and production of the Spirit, I need your power, Holy Spirit, and I no longer do it in my own strength, and in my own capacity. Second Timothy, for God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of one of power, love, and sound judgment. That's, his Holy Spirit does not give us fear. He's given us power, love, and sound judgment. Romans 5, 5, this hope will not disappoint us because God's love has been poured out in our hearts. Through who? The Holy Spirit. Who has who has given, who was given to us, and I think this is the last passage, and I'm going to let Bruce and, Bruce and Betty take us home. Dear friends, let us love one another, because love is from God. And everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. The one who does not love does not know God, because God is After you guys are done, can I, ha- can I close and explain what happens next? But let's all respond to God's word today. Once I stood in the night with my head bowed low 
in the darkness as black as the sea and my heart felt alone and i cried oh lord don't hide your face from me like a king i might live in a palace so tall with great riches to call my own but i don't know what they tell i hold Every hour, every day, from here to the great unknown, take my hand, oh, let me stand where no one stands. Jesus, praise God, where no one stands alone. We love you, folks. We love you. Jesus. You know, Bruce and I want to thank you all for allowing us to be here this morning to worship this man sermon. called Jesus with you all. And you know what? It's kind of awkward for him in a wheelchair right now. He's not even, they don't, doctors don't want him in it, but he felt like this morning. He needed just a little bit of a security blanket. So if you run out of anybody to pray for this week, remember us. Because God has still some jobs for us to do. And you know what? I love We love you all with all of our heart. Thank you so much. Oh, before you sit down, can we give them one more applause, please, for <laughs> Bruce and Betty Moses. I, I want to say a couple of things before you guys go get off the stage. I just want to say thank you so much for being here with us. Great sermon, Praise the Lord. I, I, I think we want to spend time to pray for you guys, if yes, you don't yes, mind. Yes. And we continue to pray for you guys and many things we need to pray. I just want to say also a couple of things. Number one, please visit the table and buy their CDs. Look at uh, the things that they have there. Are those necklaces? And um, please support them as you, as you can. But also, also, we will have a special offering on top of, of what we want to give to them. So please put a special offering that says, you know, Bruce and Betty Moses. And then uh, our treasurer will make sure that it will go to them. Uh, be generous with those who travel and preach the gospel. The Word of God says it in the New Testament that when they come, they are dependent on the Lord completely. And so your gift is not going to be just for them to travel, for them to, you know, do what they need to be or to do. But you are investing in God's kingdom yes. as they're preaching the gospel yes. and sharing his love and using their gifts and talents for God's glory. So as I pray, think about how, much, uh, how, how you can help bless them in this special offering that we're about to do as we pray together. Let's pray together and close our service this morning. Hallelujah, hallelujah, Jesus Christ. We praise and give glory to you for you are wonderful and there's none like you. Thank you for finding us as we are. Thank you for taking us into green pastures and giving us comfort, giving us hope, giving us joy, giving us peace, giving us all the promises that you have for us as your children, sons, and daughters that you have redeemed through the blood of Jesus Christ and that we are now a new creation in you. The old is gone and the new has come. Lord God, as we are praising you today, we give thanks for two of our special family in the Lord, Betty and Bruce, for their amazing testimony, tenacity of faith, 
to even be here today and to give their talents and, and gifts to you for us to enjoy together. Thank you, Lord, for your, for your powers. Thank you, Lord, for your provision. Thank you, Lord, for what you have done in their lives, God, for 60 plus years of their marriage, Lord. What a wonderful testimony of faithful love, God. Thank you, Lord, so much that you have brought them together at such a time as this, that we can enjoy their gifts and talents together as they sing songs and praises unto your name, that we could all rejoice at what the Lord has done in our lives. Oh, God, we pray for them as a couple, as individuals, as a married couple, Lord, as they follow you, as they continue to preach your message of reconciliation and hope, telling people that the love of Jesus is unlike anything else. And so, Lord, we pray that your provision, your healing will be upon Bruce specifically. Thank you, Lord. He belongs to you. I think he speaks already of, of his faithfulness to you, Lord, that his entire being, including his body, belongs to you, Lord. So you do what you need to do in his life. And we rejoice and we know that your plans are perfect, your timing is perfect, and we know that we can rely and depend on you today. Lord God, we rejoice because of what you've done today. Thank you, Lord. Bless them as they go. Bless them as you call them back here. Bless them in, in their coming and in their going. They belong to you now until forever. It is in your name that we humbly pray. Amen. Amen. Please give a warm applause for Bruce and Betty one more time. Make sure, make sure you visit their table. And if you have another special offering you'd like to put on the envelope, please write Betty and Bruce. And uh, we will make sure they will receive that today. God bless you guys. Have a great day. We will have prayer service tonight. So I'll see you if you want to join us. Prayer at 5 p.m. today. God bless you. Please tell Betty and Bruce how much you love them being here. <laughs>